Tonight, frustration on all sides as the backlog of disputes between Ontario landlords and tenants skyrockets. When you know you have to wait that long, it's like, why am I even... It's like, why even bother complaining? Uh, the mental health that's affecting uh, these landlords, they feel betrayed. What's behind the staggering backlog at the Ontario Landlord and Tenant Board and what's being done to fix it? Plus... We actually eliminated measles from Canada in the year 2000, so to see it come back would again be essentially a failure of public health. A warning from health officials after a baby in Toronto is hospitalized with a confirmed case of the measles and... What do you want to be when you grow up? Uh, a famous hockey player. A record-sized crowd and a big boost of inspiration how the PWHL is lifting up the next generation of hockey greats. This is CBC Saturday News. Thanks for joining us. A staggering backlog that only appears to be getting worse. That's how a group that keeps tabs on Ontario's landlord and tenant board describes its caseload. As Lane Harrison shows us, the frustration is hitting all sides and relief appears to be nowhere in sight. When you know you have to wait that long, it's like, why am I even... It's like, why even bother complaining? If you know Alexander Chirpak knows the frustration of dealing with Ontario's landlord and tenant board firsthand. He and other tenants were protesting rent increases in Etobicoke today, and Tribunals Watch Ontario says he's far from alone in his struggles with the system. Ontario's ombudsman has said that the board is fundamentally unequipped to deal with the problem of its staggering backlog. In a report published this week, Tribunal's Watch says the backlog is growing every year as fewer cases are resolved. That backlog has reached 53,000 cases, according to the LTB's last annual report. The group says the shift to virtual hearings is partially to blame because they are harder for low-income tenants to access. Far fewer adjudicators with less money were able to handle more cases without creating a backlog. So although the government says that its electronic, you know, virtual hearing model is, uh, it improves accessibility and efficiency, and maybe on the surface it seems attractive that it would, it actually isn't working. And the, the numbers make that very, very clear. The province tells CBC News today it's working to streamline the process. A spokesperson says more staff are being brought on and a new case management system is being implemented. The issue impacts both sides of the renting equation. Tenants face the worst delays, with the average wait time for a resolution being more than 400 days, compared to 70 in 2018. And landlords are also suffering. The average wait time for an eviction order is more than 300 days, compared to about 30. And uh, if the income is not coming in, that's a big problem. This small landlord says it's especially frustrating for those waiting to evict tenants who aren't paying. But the more important thing is uh, the mental health that's affecting uh, this landlord. They feel betrayed. Looking at the data, it might seem like the issues at the Landlord and Tenant Board are insurmountable, but Tribunals Watch Ontario has put forward a few solutions. Firstly, they would like to see hearings go back to in-person with a virtual option to make them more accessible for everyone. Secondly, they want to see a panel established within the LTB that would work at reducing the backlog under separate leadership, something they say has worked at other struggling tribunals. Lane Harrison, CBC News, Toronto. We have some developing news out of North York tonight where police say a person has died after being shot. It happened around 3 p.m. this afternoon. Police were called to the area of Jane Street and Driftwood Avenue after reports of gunshots being heard. Now, police are so far not releasing an age or gender of the victim, but say they died after being taken to hospital. They also say suspects took off in a black Mazda 6 hatchback. Now, police are expected to be updating the media at any moment. We'll have the latest for you on our website. Pro-Palestinian rallies were held at major cities around the world today, including Ottawa as well as Toronto. You're looking at Bay and Front Street just outside of Union Station earlier this afternoon. A coalition of organizations came together, including health workers and doctors. Toronto police say approximately 6,000 demonstrators took part. For family members with loved ones in Gaza, the fear and anxiety is only intensifying. So uh, I have my sister and her husband and five children between the age of 2 and 14 years old. 
My sister currently located in the Gaza city. Uh, the last we heard two days from her, she spoke to my mom that she said she has lost 20 kilo. They are starving. They have no food. You know, she, she told my mom that's her words. She looks like a ghost, you know, for like they're searching from a house to a house from the rubbles looking for some food just to feed their children. My, my sister told my mom she's trying to really have the smallest bite that can let her alive, keep alive, while she's trying to feed her kids. My sister said it, like, you know, we, we have two options. We, uh, we stay in Gaza City while there's no food, no water, nothing of any basic necessity. Even her child, his, his, he fell while he was looking for some food. Yemen, he's 11 years old. While he's searching for food, he fractured his leg. They taped two pieces of, of wood around his leg to stabilize his legs because it's, it's just a fraction, but it could really impact his future movement forever, you know? And, and this, she said to my mom, like, they either die from a bullet while they are trying to go to the south and maybe have some bites of food or just die from starvation in Gaza. So basically the Israel Hamas war dominated much of the discussion today as world leaders meet at the Munich Security Conference. Ithil Musa has more. Outside the Munich Security Conference Saturday were protests in support of Palestinians caught in the deadly Israel-Hamas war and Ukrainians fighting against Russia's invasion. Inside, discussions centered on how to tackle those very issues. It is a place and a space within which world leaders in a variety of different um, contexts can exchange views. For Ukraine's leader, it's a matter of dwindling military resources. The country's European allies are appealing to the U.S. Congress to approve a package that includes $60 billion in aid. We can get our land back, and Putin can lose. The Kremlin's possible role in the suspicious death of Russia's most vocal opposition figure was also a topic of discussion. Alexei Navalny died at a penal colony in the Arctic Circle on Friday. According to prison officials, he fell unconscious after a walk. But Western leaders, including Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, are casting the blame squarely on Russia's president, Vladimir Putin. International political leaders around the world must make as strong a statement as possible. They must demand investigations. Talks at the Munich Security Conference also focused on Israel's response to Hamas's October 7th attack and its planned military operation in Rafah, a move some leaders think could be catastrophic. The balance between the solidarity of a country that has been attacked in a terrible way has the right to defend itself and then to find this balance with what humanitarian law implies. While family members of hostages taken by Hamas stood with photos of their loved ones, Israel's president justified a ground offensive this way. If you want to uproot the terror infrastructure in order to enable a better future for the Palestinians and Israelis, you have to go in physically. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken says the U.S. cannot support an Israeli military ground operation in Rafah without a credible plan to protect the more than one million people sheltering there. Ithil Musa, CBC News, Toronto. As you just heard Ithil say, it's still unclear how Kremlin critic Alexei Navalny died or even where his body is. His mother is in the remote region where he was a prisoner. Supporters say she was told his body was at a morgue. The morgue denied that. Across Russia, makeshift memorials have sprung up. Activists report 340 arrests at events honoring him. Now, Russian officials say the body will be held until the investigation is complete. There has been a widespread outpouring of sadness and outrage from the international community in hearing about Navalny's death, including in Toronto. This was the scene last night in front of the Russian consulate. Demonstrators were calling on Canada and other countries to stand up against Putin's human rights abuses. Closer to home, protesters are gathering in Ottawa this weekend, marking the second anniversary of the so-called Freedom Convoy, 
Organizers say they were in touch with law enforcement while planning the event to ensure it remains safe and lawful. Joseph Tooney was among the crowd. Here on Parliament Hill, people have gathered to celebrate the two-year anniversary of the self-described Freedom Convoy movement. It's been two years since police moved in to end the protest. So far today, we've seen dance parties, uh, the cars driving by have been honking, and it wouldn't be a two-year celebration event without some chanting of the word freedom. Many people, I would say, have turned up today. Uh, one of the organizers I spoke to said that people were, he, he thinks they were inspired to attend uh, when after the federal court uh, found that the invocation of the Emergencies Act was unreasonable and contravened charter rights. With the, uh, the recent ruling from uh, Justice Mosley about the invocation of the Emergency Act being unjustified, um, it was a reason for us to come out and, and make sure that people know we're, we're still out here. And there we go. The federal government is appealing uh, that decision, but it, it definitely adds to the movement here. But a big change, I, I think from two years ago that people will notice, is obviously uh, the darn cars actually uh, filling up the nearby streets. The organizers that we spoke to said that they, they've been in contact with police and are planning a safe and lawful event. Joseph Tunney, CBC News, Ottawa. The controversial budget battle at Toronto City Hall is now over with police winning their fight for a $20 million increase. But that extra funding comes with expectations that police tackle emergency call response times. Right now for priority calls, it's 22 minutes. The police budget will be scrutinized much earlier and much more closely. So maybe the savings will come next year more than this year. That's something, something that needs to happen. The police have been used to getting exactly what they want from first in the last uh, decade or so, first from um, Mayor Rob Ford and then from Mayor Tory. And this year um, there is some pushback, but not strong enough for the for the police department to not also push. Mayor Olivia Chow initially pushed against the full increase, but now that police have their full request, she expects results. Council did attach some strings to the funding. They have asked the chief to cut response times, hire more frontline officers, and provide a multi-year staffing plan. Health officials are sounding the alarm after a baby in Toronto has a confirmed case of the measles and is in hospital. Toronto Public Health say the case is linked to travel. Now, this news comes after a similar case in Peel region was announced earlier this week. Experts say vaccination rates in Canada are starting to slide. In order to have herd immunity from measles, you need to have a very high vaccination rate. It needs to be over 90%, closer to 95%. Um, people use the term herd immunity a lot during the pandemic, and they often used it wrong. What herd immunity means is that you need to have a very, very high vaccination rate. And when you get to that point, there aren't enough susceptible people out there for the virus to have community spread. And so all the cases of measles that we've seen since the year 2000 have often been people who were unvaccinated, traveled overseas, got sick, and then came back with the illness. What we're seeing now and what is worrisome in that in countries like Canada, the U.S. and the U.K., you are seeing instances of community spread where people are infecting each other. And that's what has people very, very worried, because if we have a resurgence of measles, well, that's going to be one more thing that's making people sick and landing them in hospital. Whereas if we can maintain our high vaccination rates, we will not have community spread of measles and we won't see its return because we actually eliminated measles from Canada in the year 2000. So to see it come back would, again, be essentially a failure of public health. Earlier this month, the World Health Organization warned Europe is seeing an uptick in measles outbreaks and it's only a question of time before they start happening in Canada too. If you're traveling, experts say get vaccinated. Two doses is considered up to date. Sophia is back with us this long weekend. Hooray for that. And we had some sunshine, just a beautiful day out there. A little chilly, but, you know, perfect for February. Yeah, coldest daytime high, Shannon, since January the 20th. And
minus seven mark as it was today, but it was quite the U-turn after the mild stretch that we've had. Happy to be back with all of you as well. Minus seven right now and slowly dropping. This evening will feel like the minus mid-teens, uh, minus high teens as well with the wind chill values. Um, it has been so mild and this has been a big U-turn and we have snow to talk about as well. You got about 10 centimeters north of the GTA, 15 to 20 around the Georgian and the Huron shores. Uh, this was Thursday throughout that afternoon hours where that snow came down rather fast and we in the city of Toronto had our biggest helping of snow that we've had so far this season. We are slowly inching up that season snowfall total to about 46.8 so far from where we are normally but there is more to come folks coming up a little bit more in the long range. I'll detail the timing and we'll talk more about these snow squall warnings. Uh, all of you on any of the major lakes could expect anywhere from 15 to 25 Ooh. centimeters of snow and some of that could inch a little bit close towards the GTA. Okay, thanks, Sophia. We'll see you shortly. It has been a great first season for the Professional Women's Hockey League, and it got even better last night. For the first time ever, players took to the ice at Scotiabank Arena with the stands full of fans. As AnimCon shows us, that includes many young players with some big dreams of their own. The love for hockey bonds these girls together, and they have big dreams that don't feel so out of reach anymore. Players from the Toronto Leaside Girls Hockey Association were in the stands at Scotiabank Arena last night, where the PWHL played for the first time in front of a sold-out crowd. I thought maybe one day I could make it in that position. The association says more women and girls signing up than ever before. Members put up this mural celebrating the sports stars two weeks ago. Everyone who goes up the ramp to get on the ice at Leaside is going to go past these amazing role models. It's been a full circle moment for Kim McCullough. She played here, played for the NWHL, and even coached some of the stars in the current national team. I remember playing games at that level, at rinks like this, where you'd have tons of Olympians, national team players, and then you'd have 10 people in the stands. Last night's crowd was a record breaker at more than 19,000 fans. The PWHL says it's been consistently selling out the Madame Athletic Centre, an arena with a roughly 2,500 person capacity. Hockey associations across the province saw it coming. The Burlington Girls Hockey Club had to turn away players in recent years. Now, the club is fighting for the same ice time that boys teams get. The city has been uh, working with us and we will um, close the gap on that going into next season, which is a huge win for our organization. And the interest goes beyond the province. The Ontario Hockey Academy is seeing athletes from around the world. You're starting to see that the girls are a little bit more invested into watching certain hockey players, which is then going to drive their own talent, their own, you know, way of playing. And after seeing the stars last night, many are willing to put in the work. I want to be a hockey player. A famous hockey player. A famous hockey player. Adam Kahn, CBC News, Toronto. And we'll be watching. The Toronto Marlies and Holland Bloorview Kids Rehabilitation Hospital held an adaptive sledge hockey demo today in downtown Toronto. It's all part of the hospital's annual fundraising campaign. They were, we're here in support of Case for Kids and we're so excited to be partnering with the Toronto Marlies for such a great event. The Toronto Marlies are really long-lasting friends of ours who have shown their support in many different ways. Recently, they actually just came in and visited some of our uh, clients and families. And uh, now they're hosting us today to have a really big event and drum up some excitement for us and spread some awareness as well about the campaign. People of all ages got to take part in today's event while also raising awareness for kids with disabilities and inclusion in sports. We got to speak to the dynamic duo who took to the ice today. I really just wanted to play hockey, but I couldn't. I, every time I tried to skate, I took three steps and fell flat on my face. Sludge hockey was a way for me to play. I just like it because people without disabilities can play hockey, so I think it's nice that people with disabilities can also play. Hey, Alex and Carson, thanks for sharing that. Holland Bloorview Hospital is focused on both patient care and research. Since it started in 2017, Kate's for Kids has raised more than $5 million for the hospital. We're heading into a quick break, but Sophia's back with your full forecast right after this. 
After all the record-breaking warm weather, finally we had a blast of winter this week. You're looking at the hill at Cedarvale Park. Lots of people out enjoying all the recent snow. It's the first snow since Toronto City Hall reversed its toboggan ban. Definitely some welcome news for all those out enjoying the hill today. Building snowman, going tobogganing, all sorts of fun stuff to do this long weekend. Yeah, we got to make up for that lost time we've had so far. I got something else to throw at you. The cold air. It will be the pattern over this upcoming work weekend into next weekend. Transient lobes of Arctic air will make swings and misses at us over the next week or two, really, continuing into next weekend. And what this is going to mean is when we do have this cold northern flow above us, there will be plenty more snow to add to those toboggan hills, folks. Uh, overnight and into tomorrow morning, we will have a little bit of a low pressure system starting with this battle of these two little air masses and then into tomorrow uh, into the overnight period and into tomorrow morning these bands of lake effect snow squalls will really ramp up some of which will even make it all the way to the Ottawa Valley those of you Coburg Kingston Niagara Falls even on the Georgian and the Huron shores will all be affected by near whiteout conditions and near zero visibility on many of the major roadways as you will have a sample of these bands of lake effect squalls they won't lock in for an extremely long period of time but for some of these areas under snow squall warning there will be again very dicey white knuckle drives and what could be up to 15 to 25 more centimeters of snowfall we'll see about three to five around the gta it will add to all of that helping of snow that we had this past week now what is going to happen in the wake of these squalls and this system is that we will be left in really the sort of cold northerly flow. Uh, chilly evenings ahead, feeling into the minus teens. Daytime highs for the next few days that will not be above the freezing mark. In fact, they will be a few degrees below and feeling much cooler for those of you uh, anywhere north really of the Georgian shores. Into next weekend, chillier conditions yet again and the potential of rain and a warm up midweek. That roller coaster is back again, <laughs> Shannon. It's it continues. Thanks so much, Sophia. Well, Family Day is just around the corner. Have you considered adding to yours? That's the question Von Animal Services was asking their, during their dog adopt-a-thon today. No appointments needed today. Just 150 bucks to cover rabies, vaccines, sterilization, microchip, and pet licenses for Vaughn residents. Many shelters and humane societies in the GTA are appealing to the community to adopt. Pet surrenders have increased since COVID-19 restrictions eased. Now, Vaughn Animal Services says all those furry characters are on their city's website. Oh, my goodness. That little guy was very cute. Okay, I got distracted. That's our show for tonight. Thanks for watching. We hope you'll be back with us tomorrow night at 11. We're going to leave you now with some more video of some very adorable dogs. We hope you have a great night.